Rug by Philip K. Dick Rug, the dog said. He rested his paws on the top of the fence and looked around him. The Rug came running into the yard. It was early morning, and the sun had not really come up yet. The air was cold and grey, and the walls of the house were damp with moisture. The dog opened his jaws a little as he watched, his big black paws clutching the wood of the fence. The Rug stood by the open gate, looking into the yard. He was a small Rug, thin and white, on wobbly legs. The Rug blinked at the dog, and the dog showed his teeth. Rug, he said again. The sound echoed into the silent half-darkness. Nothing moved nor stirred. The dog dropped down and walked back across the yard to the porch steps. He sat down on the bottom step and watched the Rug. The Rug glanced at him. Then he stretched his neck up to the window of the house just above him. He sniffed at the window. The dog came flashing across the yard. He hit the fence, and the gate shuddered and groaned. The Rug was walking quickly up the path, hurrying with funny little steps, mincing along. The dog lay down against the slats of the gate, breathing heavily, his red tongue hanging. He watched the Rug disappear. The dog lay silently, his eyes bright and black. The day was beginning to come. The sky turned a little whiter, and from all around the sounds of people echoed through the morning air. Lights popped on behind shades. In the chilly dawn, a window was opened. The dog did not move. He watched the path. In the kitchen, Mrs. Cardosi poured water into the coffee pot. Steam rose from the water, blinding her. She set the pot down on the edge of the stove and went into the pantry. When she came back, Alf was standing at the door of the kitchen. He put his glasses on. You bring the paper, he said. It's outside. Alf Cardosi walked across the kitchen. He threw the bolt on the back door and stepped out onto the porch. He looked into the grey, damp morning. At the fence, Boris lay, black and furry, his tongue out. Put the tongue in, Alf said. The dog looked quickly up. His tail beat against the ground. The tongue, Alf said. Put the tongue in. The dog and the man looked at one another. The dog whined. His eyes were bright and feverish. Rug, he said softly. What? Alf looked around. Someone coming? The paper boy come? The dog stared at him, his mouth open. You certainly upset these days, Alf said. You better take it easy. We're both getting too old for excitement. He went inside the house. The sun came up. The street became bright and alive with colour. The postman went along the sidewalk with his letters and magazines. Some children hurried by, laughing and talking. About eleven o'clock, Mrs. Cardossi swept the front porch. She sniffed the air, pausing for a moment. Smells good today, she said. That means it's going to be warm. In the heat of the noonday sun, the black dog lay stretched out full length under the porch. His chest rose and fell. In the cherry tree, the birds were playing, squawking and chattering to each other. Once in a while, Boris raised his head and looked at them. Presently, he got to his feet and trotted down under the tree. He was standing under the tree when he saw the two rugs sitting on the fence, watching him. He's big, the first rug said. Most guardians aren't as big as this. The other rug nodded, his head wobbling on his neck. Boris watched them without moving, his body stiff and hard. The rugs were silent now, looking at the big dog with his shaggy ruff of white around his neck. How is the offering urn? the first rug said. Is it almost full? Yes, the other nodded. Almost ready. You there, the first rug said, raising his voice. Do you hear me? We've decided to accept the offering this time. So you remember to let us in. No nonsense now. Don't forget, the other added. It won't be long. Boris said nothing. The two rugs leaped off the fence and went over together just beyond the walk. One of them brought out a map and they studied it. This area really is none too good for a first trial, the first rug said. 
too many guardians. Now, the north side area. They decided, the other rogue said, there are so many factors. Of course. They glanced at Boris and moved back farther from the fence. He could not hear the rest of what they were saying. Presently, the rogues put their map away and went off down the path. Boris walked over to the fence and sniffed the boards. He smelled the sickly, rotten odour of rugs, and the hair stood up on his back. That night, when Alf Cardossi came home, the dog was standing at the gate, looking up the walk. Alf opened the gate and went into the yard. Hi, are you? he said, thumping the dog's side. You stop worrying. Seems like you've been nervous of late. You didn't used to be that way. Boris whined, looking intently up into the man's face. You a good dog, Boris, Alf said. You pretty big, too, for a dog. You don't remember long ago how you used to be only a little bit of a puppy. Boris leaned against the man's leg. You a good dog, Alf murmured. I sure wish I knew what is on your mind. He went inside the house. Mrs. Cardossi was setting the table for dinner. Alf went into the living room and took his coat and hat off. He set his lunch pail down on the sideboard and came back into the kitchen. What's the matter? Mrs. Cardossi said. That dog got to stop making all that noise, barking. The neighbour's going to complain to the police again. I hope we don't have to give him to your brother, Mrs. Cardossi said, folding her arms. But he sure goes crazy, especially on Friday morning, when the garbage men come. Maybe he'll calm down, Alf said. He lit his pipe and smoked solemnly. He didn't used to be that way. Maybe he'll get better, like he was. We'll see, Mrs. Cardossi said. The sun rose up cold and ominous. Mist hung over all the trees and in the low places. It was Friday morning. The black dog lay under the porch, listening, his eyes wide and staring. His coat was stiff with hoar frost and the breath from his nostrils made clouds of steam in the thin air. Suddenly, he turned his head and leaped up. From far off, a long way away, a faint sound came. A kind of crashing sound. Rug, Boris cried, looking around. He hurried to the gate and stood up, his paws on top of the fence. In the distance, the sound came again, louder now, not as far away as before. It was a crashing, clanging sound, as if something were being rolled back, as if a great door were being opened. Rug, Boris cried. He stared up anxiously at the darkened windows above him. Nothing stirred. Nothing. And along the street the rugs came. The rugs and their truck moved along, bouncing against the rough stones, crashing and whirring. Rug, Boris cried and he leaped, his eyes blazing. Then he became more calm. He settled himself down on the ground and waited, listening. Out in front, the rugs stopped their truck. He could hear them opening the doors, stepping down onto the sidewalk. Boris ran around in a little circle. He whined, and his muzzle turned once again towards the house. Inside the warm, dark bedroom, Mr. Cardossi sat up a little in bed, and squinted at the clock. That damn dog, he muttered. That damn dog! He turned his face towards the pillow and closed his eyes. The rugs were coming down the path now. The first rug pushed against the gate, and the gate opened. The rugs came into the yard. The dog backed away from them. Rug, rug, he cried. The horrid, bitter smell of rugs came to his nose, and he turned away. The offering urn, the first rug said. It is full, I think. He smiled at the rigid, angry dog. How very good of you, he said. The rugs came toward the metal can, and one of them took the lid from it. Rug, rug, Boris cried, huddled against the bottom of the porch steps. His body shook with horror. The rugs were lifting up the big metal can, turning it on its side. The contents poured out onto the ground, and the rugs scooped the sacks of bulging, splitting paper together, catching at the orange peels and fragments, the bits of toast and eggshells. One of the rugs popped an eggshell into his mouth. His teeth crunched the eggshell. Rug, 
Boris cried hopelessly, almost to himself. The rugs were almost finished with their work of gathering up the offering. They stopped for a moment, looking at Boris. Then, slowly, silently, the rugs looked up, up the side of the house, along the stucco to the window, with its brown shade pulled tightly down. Rug! Boris screamed, and he came toward them, dancing with fury and dismay. Reluctantly, the rugs turned away from the window. They went out through the gate, closing it behind them. Look at him, the last rug said with contempt, pulling his corner of the blanket up on his shoulder. Boris strained against the fence, his mouth open, snapping wildly. The biggest rug began to wave his arms furiously, and Boris retreated. He settled down at the bottom of the porch steps, his mouth still open, and from the depths of him an unhappy, terrible moan issued forth, a wail of misery and despair. Come on, the other rug said to the lingering rug at the fence. They walked up the path. Well, except for these little places around the guardians, this area is well cleared, the biggest rug said. I'll be glad when this particular guardian is done. He certainly causes us a lot of trouble. Don't be impatient, one of the rugs said. He grinned. Our truck is full enough as it is. Let's leave something for next week. All the rugs laughed. They went on up the path, carrying the offering in the dirty, sagging blanket. Philip K. Dick's Notes on Rug Rug was written in November 1951. Published in Fantasy and Science Fiction, February 1953, his first seal. The first thing you do when you sell your first story is phone up your best friend and tell him, whereupon he hangs up on you, which puzzles you until you realise that he is trying to sell stories too, and hasn't managed to do it. That sobers you, that reaction. But then, when your wife comes home and you tell her, and she doesn't hang up on you, she is very pleased and excited. At the time I sold Rug to Anthony Boucher, at fantasy and science fiction, I was managing a record store part-time and writing part-time. If anyone asked me what I did, I always said, I'm a writer. This was in Berkeley in 1951. Everybody was a writer. No one had ever sold anything. In fact, most of the people I knew believed it to be crass and undignified to submit a story to a magazine. You wrote it, read it aloud to your friends, and finally it was forgotten. That was Berkeley in those days. Another problem for me in getting everyone to be awed was that my story was not a literary story in a little magazine, but a science fiction story. Science fiction was not read by people in Berkeley in those days, except for a small group of fans who were very strange. They looked like animated vegetables. But what about your serious writing? People said to me. I was under the impression that Rug was quite a serious story. It tells of fear. It tells of loyalty, it tells of obscure menace and a good creature who cannot convey knowledge of that menace to those he loves. What could be more serious a theme than this? What people really meant by serious was important. Science fiction was, by definition, not important. I cringed over the weeks following my sale of Rug as I realised the serious codes of behaviour I had broken by selling my story and a science fiction story at that. To make matters worse, I now have begun to nurse the delusion that I might be able to make a living as a writer. The fantasy in my head was that I could quit my job at the record store, buy a better typewriter and write all the time, and still make the payments on my house. As soon as you start thinking that, they come for you and haul you away. It's for your own good. When your discharge later on is cured, you no longer have that fantasy. You go back to work at the record store, or the supermarket, or polishing shoes. See, the thing is, being a writer is, well, it's like the time I asked a friend of mine what field he was going into when he got out of college, and he said, I'm going to be a pirate. He was dead serious. The fact that Rug sold was due to Tony Boucher outlining to me how the original version should be changed. Without his help, I'd still be in the record business. I mean that very seriously. At that time, Tony ran a little writing class, working out of the living room of his home in Berkeley. He read our stories aloud and we'd see, not just that they were awful, but how they could be cured. 
Tony saw no point in simply making it clear that what you had written was no good. He assisted you in transmuting the thing into art. Tony knew what made up good writing. He charged you, get this, one dollar a week for this. One dollar! If ever there was a good man in this world it was Anthony Boucher. We really loved him. We used to get together once a week and play poker. Poker, opera and writing were all equally important to Tony. I miss him very much. Back in 1974 I dreamed one night that I had passed across into the next world and it was Tony who was waiting for me to show up there. Tears filled my eyes when I think of that dream. There he was, but transformed into Tony the Tiger, like in that breakfast cereal ad. In the dream he was filled with delight and so was I. But it was a dream. Tony Boucher is gone. But I am still a writer, because of him. Whenever I sit down to start a novel or a story, a bit of the memory of that man returns to me. I guess he taught me to write out of love, not out of ambition. It's a good lesson for all activities in this world. This little story, Rug, is about an actual dog, like Tony, gone now. The dog's actual name was Snooper, and he believed as much in his work as I did in mine. His work, apparently, was to see that no one stole the food from the owner's garbage can. Snooper was labouring under the delusion that his owners considered the garbage valuable. Every day they'd carry out paper sacks of delicious food and carefully deposit them in a strong metal container, placing the lid down firmly. At the end of the week the garbage can was full, whereupon the worst assortment of evil entities in the Sol system drove up in a huge truck and stole the food. Snooper knew which day of the week this happened on. It was always on Friday. So about 5am on Friday, Snooper would emit his first bark. My wife and I figured that was about the time the garbage men's alarm clocks were going off. Snooper knew when they left their houses. He could hear them. He was the only one who knew. Everybody else ignored what was afoot. Snooper must have thought he inhabited a planet of lunatics. His owners, and everyone else in Berkeley, could hear the garbage men coming, but no one did anything. His barking drove me out of my mind every week, but I was more fascinated by Snooper's logic than I was annoyed by his frantic efforts to rouse us. I asked myself, what must the world look like to that dog? Obviously he doesn't see as we see. He has developed a complete system of beliefs, a world view totally different from ours, but logical given the evidence he is basing it on. So here, in a primitive form, is the basis of much of my 27 years of professional writing. The attempt to get into another person's head or another creature's head and see out from his eyes or its eyes and the more different that person is from the rest of us, the better. You start with the sentient entity and work outward, inferring its world. Obviously, you can't ever really know what its world is like, but I think you can make some pretty good guesses. I began to develop the idea that each creature lives in a world somewhat different from all the other creatures in their worlds. I still think this is true. To Snooper, garbage men were sinister and horrible. I think he literally saw them differently than we humans did. This notion about each creature viewing the world differently from all other creatures, not everyone would agree with me. Tony Boucher was very anxious to have a particular major anthologizer whom we will call J.M., read Rug to see if she might use it. Her reaction astounded me. Garbage men do not look like that, she wrote me. They do not have pencil-thin necks and heads that wobble. They do not eat people. I think she listed something like twelve errors in the story, all having to do with how I presented the garbage men. I wrote back explaining that, yes, she was right, but to a dog. Well, all right, the dog was wrong. Admittedly. The dog was a little crazy on the subject. We're not just dealing with a dog and a dog's view of garbage men, but a crazy dog who has been driven crazy by these weekly raids on the garbage can. The dog has reached a point of desperation. I wanted to convey that. In fact, that was the whole point of the story. The dog had run out of options and was demented by this weekly event. And the rugs knew it. They enjoyed it. They taunted the dog. 
they pandered to his lunacy. Ms. J.M. rejected the story from her anthology, but Tony printed it, and it's still in print. In fact, it's in a high school textbook now. I spoke to a high school class who'd been assigned the story, and all of the kids understood it. Interestingly, it was a blind student who seemed to grasp the story best. He knew from the beginning what the word rube meant. He felt the dog's despair, the dog's frustrated fury, and the bitter sense of defeat over and over again. Maybe somewhere between 1951 and 1971, we all grew up to dangers and transformations of the ordinary, which we had never recognised before. I don't know, but anyhow, Rug, my first seal, is biographical. I watched the dog suffer, and I understood a little, not much, maybe, but a little, of what was destroying him, and I wanted to speak for him. That's the whole of it right there. Snooper couldn't talk. I could. In fact, I could write it down, and someone could publish it, and many people could read it. Writing fiction has to do with this, becoming the voice for those without voices, if you see what I mean. It's not your own voice, you the author. It is all those other voices which normally go unheard. The dog Snooper is dead, but the dog in the story, Boris, is alive. Tony Boucher is dead, and one day I will be, and alas, so will you. But when I was with that high school class and we were discussing Rug in 1971, exactly 20 years after I sold the story originally, Snooper's barking and his anguish, his noble efforts, were still alive, which he deserved. My story is my gift to an animal, to a creature who neither sees nor hears, now, who no longer barks. But God damn it, he was doing the right thing, even if Ms. J.M. didn't understand. I love this story, and I doubt if I write any better today than I did in 1951 when I wrote it. I just write longer. Hi everyone, I'm Doc Sloan, and I'd like to thank you for watching my science fiction station. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback on our videos. If you enjoy the content, please give it a like, and if you're a bit of a fan of science fiction, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and spread the word. Thanks very much. Bye bye.